If I could uh, call you back, great to see you chatting. And if you have a one John open in front of you, that's great. That some of the passages and part of the passage will be on the screen, but it's it's very good to sort of see a bigger picture uh, with the Bibles open in front of you. And thank you, Sam, for praying for me. That's very good. Um, most of you know, if you've just joined us, we're doing a short series uh, of talks on love as a response to Easter. We've looked at love through Easter, love, the love of God to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And rather than just sort of park Easter and move on, going back into our series on Acts, we've decided to pause Acts for a bit and just look at how we might respond to God's good love towards us. So here in the Boathouse we're doing uh, four talks, so a short series on responding to Easter. And the four talks are this, loving God, loving neighbours, loving enemies and loving church. Really it's responding to God in love for God and love for neighbour. But uh, we're looking at neighbour over three weeks. So we, last week we looked at uh, loving God. Uh, this week will be loving neighbours. Next will be loving enemies. And the last one will be loving well, each other but in church. So that, that's where we're up to, loving neighbours or loving others. Now last week we looked at loving God, loving Him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and our passage was Deuteronomy and the reason we looked at Deuteronomy is that the Israelites were told to love God in response to their salvation Deuteronomy came after the Exodus uh, the Exodus came first that is God's love is displayed so beautifully through their salvation from slavery now in response to that love me it wasn't the other way around. It's so important to get that right. It wasn't love me, God saying love me, and then I will show my love to you and rescue you. His love, his rescue, his salvation came first, and it's response. And if that's what the Israelites were told to do in, in response to God's love then, how much more are we to respond with loving God when he's loved us so much and it's displayed so brilliantly and climactically in the Lord's death and resurrection. This week we're looking at loving others and the passage that was read to you is, is kind of the main passage that we're going to hang out in uh, this evening. And I think in this passage John gives us four reasons why we're to love one another. Okay, the four reasons that I think John gives us in uh, this uh, passage. Uh, first of all, we're commanded to do it. Secondly, it should be in our very nature as Christians. If you're a Christian, it should be in your very being, in your nature to love others. Thirdly, as Christians, we should follow Christ's example. And then fourthly, loving others is actually the goal of what Jesus did on the cross and resurrection. So some intriguing things to think about. Now, admittedly, I, I find the letters of John, even John's Gospel and Revelation, which he's all responsible for, hard to read. Um, I'm very encouraged when the Apostle Peter says in one of his letters that he finds some of Paul's things hard to read and understand. So there's an Apostle saying, oh, I find another Apostle hard to read and understand. I'm encouraged by that. Um, I find John a bit like that. I can understand Paul, I think, reasonably well. There are things that will, will always stretch me, but John I find really hard and I don't know whether when it was read out to you by Ricky whether you found that hard to follow. Uh, I think the reason is is because John intertwines his arguments. He, he weaves them round one another. So they don't 
he doesn't state one thing and then the next thing and then the next. It's not sort of following on from the other. And his gospel is even like this. He winds things. So that one argument appears so early in the text and then comes back later while he's arguing for another thing. But they all go together. Once you unpack them, it's beautiful. And that's what I'm attempting to do tonight, to show his four arguments. So we actually do move around the text a bit. It's not in chronological sequence. Um, but yeah, that, there's the method in my madness. Okay, here, here are the, the, <coughs> the first thing uh, that we're to uh, do. We should love others because as Christians we're commanded to do it. It's as plain as the nose on your face. We're commanded to love others because we're command because uh, God told us to do it. You see it in verse three twenty three. So not on the screen, but in three twenty three, you see it. There's the command to love one another, to love others. Or uh, chapter four, verse seven. Dear friends, let us love one another. Or in verse 12 of chapter 4, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, here is the apostle commanding us. And then, last of all, in our passage anyway, verse 21, 421, he's given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And I think John is thinking primarily of what Jesus said when he refers to this command of what Jesus said on the night he was betrayed the Thursday night of Easter Jesus gave this command just after he'd washed the disciples feet in John 13 Jesus said a new command I give to you love one another as I have loved you so you must love one another by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you Love one another. So there's it very clear from the Lord's mouth himself saying that we are to love one another. And I think many of you would know Jesus endorsed the Old Testament command to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said the whole law and the prophets hang on those two commands. So here we have it from an apostle. A divinely inspired apostle John telling us here it is in his letter to us a command to us here it is from the words or lips of Jesus and we can also find it in the Old Testament I'm trying to bring out all my authoritative punches that where to do this from the Old Testament from a divinely inspired apostle from the Lord himself we are commanded to love one another now in one sense, I could draw stumps there. We could pray, we could sing a song, and we'd all go home. Because, look, there it is in the Bible, we should do it. No, basically. <laughs> However, we're all sinners, and we need a bit more than that. We need inspiring. And John knows that, and that's why his letter isn't very short. Uh, yeah, isn't very short. It's not as though he just says, love one another, he puts his pen down, and it's a one sentence letter. He builds a whole lot of other things around it and inspires us and gives us more reasons for loving others. So that brings us to the, the second thing. Uh, we should love others. We should love our neighbors um, because as Christians, it should be in our very nature. Once you've become a Christian, it should be in your very nature to love others. Now it's a bit complicated in the way John words it, but here we go. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another for or because. Dear friends, let us love one another. Why? Well, for or because love comes from God. Now it's a full stop there, but that's not by any means the end of the argument. But we're to love one another because love comes from God. And then he explains it. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. 
And he continues this argument in verse 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He's actually given us his Holy Spirit. As Christians, God, by his Spirit, lives in us. He's given us of his Spirit. And then down to 16. And so we know and rely on the love of God that... Uh, sorry. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love listens, lives in God and God in them. Now what is, he, what is he saying here? Well, I think probably the way to unpack it is looking at God is love. You see it twice in the text. God is love. What does he mean by that? We're saying everything that God is, everything that he does, his whole being is love. Complete and utter love. His DNA is love. Now it doesn't mean, it's not a reciprocal statement, it doesn't mean that love is God. So wherever you see love, you're seeing God, it doesn't mean that. But it's saying of God, everything about him is love. <coughs> it's the DNA that makes up God. It's the oxygen he breathes. It's the atoms in the Godhood, if you like. In fact, do you notice the Trinity features all the way through uh, John's writings? And particularly in this passage. So you see God the Father, the Spirit, and the Son in this passage. And that is because God is three persons loving in community within the Godhead. There's, there's love and harmony and, and, um, and all that love brings within the members of the Trinity. God is love, says John, twice. Now, therefore, he's saying, if God is love and he has put his spirit in us, we by our nature now should ooze love. Prick a Christian and they should bleed love. Um, I'm told, and you may have heard this before, that kids look like their parents, right? And you even today might still look like your parents. Jono, you might look like your mum. You do a bit from here in this light. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I for many years looked a lot more like my mum than my dad and that's because she's so beautiful and everything. <laughs> I'm starting to look a lot more like my dad so when I see photos of myself, particularly when I smile, I see my dad smile. Um, so I'm changing a bit. But I, I mean, by and large, we look like our parents. As Christians, we're supposed to look like our Father. If God is love, then we're supposed to look and be and act like Him. That's the argument here. God is love and He dwells in us, lives in us. And if His DNA is love, then that should be the same for us. Um, I've told you this before in another context, but it's such a good illustration for this point I couldn't resist telling you again, so forgive me uh, for those of you who have known this story from me. But there was a little girl who went to Sunday school one week, and the lesson in Sunday school was how big God was, that he created the stars and the moon and the, and, uh, the sun and the the plants and the mountains and everything. He's, God is big. He's everywhere. And she came home thinking, wow, God's massive. And then the next week, she went to Sunday school and the lesson was, when we become Christian, God lives in us by His Spirit. And how God dwells in the believer. And that confused her. And so she went home and said, Mum, week one I learned that God is really big. But week two, I heard that God lives in me. And she said, if God lives in us, wouldn't he shine through? That's the case. If God really does live in you, then he ought to, it ought to be seen in the way you treat and react to others, in the way you use your diary, in the way you work, in the way you turn up to things, in the way you answer um, the phone or emails or questions or all sorts of things. Everything you do ought to be permeated 
soaked in love. If you consider yourself a Christian. So really, this is a, a litmus test really, isn't it? It's a barometer for us. Have a look at your life to work out, am I a loving person? Do I love others? Am I living for others? Because if, if I'm claiming that I'm a Christian and God lives in me, then it will surely show forth that his light, his love will come out of me. So the argument there is, uh, uh, you know, we're to love others because of God. It should be in our very nature. Thirdly, we should love others because we, we're following Christ's example. We ought to follow Christ's example. Christ loved and we're to walk in his footsteps. Dear friends, let us love one another. Why? Because love comes from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. There's the test for you. And in verse 9, here's the example. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us in this way, we also ought to love one another in this way. This is the example for us. Jesus' death on the cross. In fact, the key to this section is verse 11. If you get verse 11, you'll understand this section of what John is saying. Think about it. How should verse 11 read normally? Because it's a bit of a surprise. How would verse 11 read in your mind normally? Wouldn't it be, this is love, not that um, we love God, but that he loved us and sent his sons and atoning sacrifice for our sins. And you'd think verse 11 would then say, dear friends, since God so loved us, we should love God. You'd think that would be what he's trying to say. But no, he's saying Jesus' death on the cross is an example to us. It's an example of how God loved. Verse 9. This is how God showed his love. He's displayed it by sending his one and only son to die for us and take on the full weight, the full responsibility of our sins. So work with me now. He's saying this is how God showed his love amongst others which is us God's the lover of others this is how God showed his love amongst other people who happen to be us he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him now in John's paradigm the world is so often the evil place it's an amazing thing that for God so loved the world because the world is evil and it's opposing God and it's against the things that he stands for and it's not generally a good place it's so unlovable however God showed his love that he sent his son for the unlovable you and me God loves others and the way he loves others is by sending his son into the world to die for us but he doesn't just say that he says no God sent his love uh, showed his love by sending his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins now this word atoning sacrifice translate a Greek word that sometimes is translated into English not as atoning uh, sacrifice but as propitiation and propitiation, if you remember, if you came to our summer school talk on it, is all about what Jesus does for God, the Father. We often talk about how the cross is what it achieves for us, for what it achieves for Christians in particular. Jesus taking the penalty we deserve so that we don't have to take it. But the cross also does something for the Father. God's wrath is on us, but 
it is thwarted, it is appeased when Jesus dies on that cross. It does something for the Father. That means, what John is saying is, the full weight of God's wrath fell on him on that cross. That's how much he loves us. It wasn't just a man dying. It was much more than that on that first Good Friday. It wasn't just a man dying. It was a man taking the full brunt, the full force of God's wrath that we deserve. And what John is saying is, God loves us with a self-sacrificing love. That through Christ, dying on that cross, he's displaying his love for us. In that enormous way, and that's the kind of love we're to have towards others. It's a great example to us. And let me just say under this, it is an example to us, but of course Jesus' death isn't only an example to us. Unfortunately, there are a number of churches in this country and abroad who will only preach that Jesus died as an example to us. That we're to just to follow it. He died the martyr's death and we're to do the same. Now it is an example to us, but it's, of course it's much more than that. John Piper came up with 50 reasons why Jesus died. Well, only one of them is an example. It is an example, and that's what he's arguing here. But just don't think it's only an example. But what he's arguing here is, look, this is how God shows love to others and where to walk in the, in the footsteps. I mean, Jesus himself said, after washing the disciples' feet, I've loved you now, love others as I have loved you. I've set an example to you, now go and do likewise. Where to do the same? To love others with a self-sacrificing love. It's very interesting, isn't it? Whenever we hear about God's love, it's almost always surrounded by or followed by action. God doesn't love just with mere words. He, he loves with action. And the greatest act or action of all is sending Christ in the world to die for you and me. That's how he shows his love and where to have that same self-sacrificing love for others. Fourthly, We should love one another, we should love others, because loving others is one of the goals of Easter. It's one of the goals of Easter. And it comes at the end of verse 14. Oh, sorry, end of verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, look at this. God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. God lives in us and is made complete in us when we love one another. What does he mean? Particularly by made complete in us. Isn't God's love perfect? Isn't it? It doesn't need us, does it? How is it that love is made complete in us? How is God's love made complete in us? Well, what it's saying here is not so much the emphasis on what it does for God, but what God's love does for us. And the goal of God's love is to bring us into a loving relationship with Him and a loving relationship with other people. That's the goal of what Easter is all about. Easter, love, is to bring us, its goal is to bring you into a loving relationship with your Creator and in a loving relationship with one another. Um, we're not fully human. Dare I say it, the agnostics, the atheists among us, which there may be, won't like this. But in, from the Christian perspective, a human being isn't fully human until they become Christian and, dare I say it, a fully committed Christian. You're not. And the Bible says this in a number of ways. It says that uh, we're kind of distorted, that sin has corrupted us, that we have kind of leprous hearts, we're blind, we're deaf. We're lame, we're even dead. Another way of putting it, as the Apostle Paul does, he says that we're all like Adam, the first human being, if you like. The word Adam in Hebrew is Adam. And we're all born in his likeness. Now, Adam 
was perfect, but sinned against God and became corrupt. And ever since then, every human being born is not the full quid. We're not totally as we're supposed to be. Um, we, you get this idea in the, in the word inhumane. When we, something, we see something that it's, it's not as it's supposed to be, we say, well, it's inhumane that what that person's doing to that person. Uh, that is the case for everyone. We're, we're not human. It's inhumane, the world that we're living in and seeing. You're not complete. The goal of Easter was to reverse that and to put you in or under a new Adam, a new man, which is Jesus. He's the only true complete one. He's the only true complete human. That's why it's incredibly theologically loaded when Jesus comes out in John's Gospel, when he's been beaten and whipped and he's got the crown of thorns on him and he's brought out before the crowd by Pontius Pilate and it's so theologically loaded when Pontius Pilate says before the crowd, behold the man. Actually, he is the man. He's the, true, he's the only one who's lived a perfect life where he loves the Father completely with all his heart, soul and strength and loves others in this incredible self-sacrificing way. The goal of Easter then was to change us and transform us and get us out of this inhumane way we live to transform him back, to us back into his likeness so that we are on the road to perfection and that will come about at the end of time of course. But being a Christian is, is setting, is changing from the old Adam to the new Adam. When you don't love other people as a Christian, you're rebelling against the very thing Jesus died for. Think about that. When you don't love others as you ought to, you're rebelling against the very thing that Jesus died and, and rose for. Or put it this way, God's love comes to its complete fulfillment when we love him and we love others. God's love comes to complete fulfillment when we love him with all our heart, soul and strength and when we love others in the way Jesus has loved us in that self-sacrificing way. Um, I think this then makes sense of verse 17 and 18. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. See, as you become more Christian, if you like, as you adopt and adapt to loving God and loving others more and more, as you allow the gospel to penetrate your heart, you have so much more confidence that when you stand on judgment day, you have no fear. You have complete and utter confidence that you're going to walk through the pearly gates uh, uh, with the greatest of ease. This is how love is made complete, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. If you're completely loving God and completely loving others, no need to fear. Now fear in other parts of the Bible is a good thing. But the fear talked about here is the fear of judgment day. But perfect love drives out that kind of fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. You're worried you're going to be punished by God. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. But the one who's made perfect in love doesn't fear. So as you uh, apply Easter, what Jesus did on that cross, as you apply the new life, the resurrection in your life, and love God and love others, well, you walk with such confidence. It's a wonderful thing. All right. Well, there's the four things. We shall love others because we're commanded to. It should be in our nature as Christians. We're to follow Christ's example. And it's actually the goal of Jesus' death and resurrection in that first Easter. Now, where does this all leave us with? Where, what, what, what does this mean for us? Um, I emailed all our regular members this week on Friday, actually, as I was preparing this talk. I emailed you all. Uh, sorry if you didn't get the email or you're not on our email list and you consider yourself a regular. But 
I emailed everyone as I'm preparing this going, I think this is one of the most important things I've had to say in the boathouse. Um, and the reason is because I think the boathouse <coughs> won't totally survive if we don't get this. Um, we, we, we could plateau along, but I don't think we'll ever grow, we'll ever really make an impact in Putney, or in London, dare I say it, if we don't really get this. Now I have to be very selective how I say this, because I know that there are some people who are very new Christians among us, some who are really struggling in their faith, others who are fairly committed, and others who are doing so much. Um, I remember watching the Masters, the Golf Masters, just the other, other week. And the golfer has different clubs to get the ball in the hole. And sometimes he's gently putting the ball on the putting green. And other times in the, in the sand pit he's getting the, the wedge out and just chipping the ball in. And other times when they're on their fairway they're, they're giving it a kind of a, a three or four iron. And then off the tee they're giving it the full one wood. Now some of us here just need a gentle putt. Others just need a, a bit of a chip. Others need a, the four or five iron, and a few of us may well need a one wood to the soul on this. But I think it's so important for the boathouse because some of us are living a half-hearted Christian life. You haven't let Easter really impact your soul. I, I, I'm not seeing the love for others as much as it should be. Now we all struggle. It's all hard to love other people. I fail every day. But I'm just wondering if I can prod you to get you to have a look at your life and the way you prioritise things in your diary, in your calendars, in, in your decision making, whether it is best whether it's most loving to others. Now I think Tom is going to preach on loving church <clears throat> in a little while. We'll cover this in more detail. I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but look, what is the most important, what is the most loving thing you can do for another person? What is the most loving thing you could do for another person? Surely it's to save that person from hell and to help them to grow to love God and love others. That's the most loving thing you can do to someone else. Imagine being on the Titanic and the Titanic is sinking and you find a lifeboat with no one in it and you get in it and you get a few others in it and you're saving people as, as many as you can because you love people, you don't want to see them drown and then you're saying to someone else in the lifeboat Hey, help out! And they say, oh no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning the seats. That's a loving thing to do because we don't want people to get dirty bums. So I'm cleaning the seats. You think, what? Well, maybe that is a loving thing to do, but the most important loving thing to do is to save someone. Help us out! Throw another rope over! Lend a hand! And the Boathouse Church is a lifeboat in Putney. And surely the most loving thing you can do is to be on board with us and help us with what we're trying to do here. And sometimes I wonder if, if people, uh, as committed Christians who I think ought to know better, are really on board with what we're trying to do. And I'm not trying to hammer someone who's not a Christian or a very new Christian here, but there are others of us who, who ought to know better. And look, there are some of us who are throwing everything they've got over the side to try and bring others. But everything we do in the boathouse church here is because we love God and we love others. We want, we want people to come, we want to make the music good, not because we like music, although we do, but we want to make the good, music good so people come because we love others. We want to get it right, we want to make it look nice, we want, to, we want everything we do, our website, the filming going on that we're trying to do, it's all because we love others, we want them, we're trying, the most loving thing to do is to rescue people. And I wonder, if you'd look at your life and go, oh, 
Maybe I haven't been on board lately with that. I know some of you are very busy, but sometimes I think, are you busy with things that more matter to you or is it for others? I'm getting under your skin here. I don't often do this. I'm frightened of rebuking people, but have a look at yourself and go, do I operate on the basis of love for others? Because we're commanded to do it. It ought to be in our very nature. Christ gave himself, died for us. And that's actually the goal of Easter. And when we don't do it, we're rebelling against the very thing that Jesus died for. Let me close with this illustration. In old USSR, a group of 60 or so Christians were meeting in a forest. So in old Russia. And they were meeting in a forest against an abandoned building. And while they were meeting, a group of Russian soldiers came with their machine guns cocked. And they said to the whole group as they paused, they said to this group, anyone who is a Christian, put your hand up and stand against the wall. And about 15 of them put their hands up and moved over and stood against the wall. The rest didn't look frightened and walked away. And then the Russian soldiers looked at these 15 and said, it's okay. We're Christians too. We just wanted to pray with real Christians. What John is doing in this letter is, is asking you, are you the real deal? Are you a real Christian? Or do you say you're a Christian? Because if you're a real Christian, it should show forth in the way you love others, in the way you prioritise, and how you do things. Particularly how you operate in a lifeboat like the Boathouse, or any other church that is a lifeboat in this world. <coughs> Let's pray. Father, forgive us when we don't love others as we ought to. We, we all struggle with this. We all know in many ways that we're supposed to do it. Please, Lord, would this text, would this passage help us to rethink uh, the way we do things personally and as a church? Help us to, to love others the way Christ does love us. Thank you for that great example. Uh, Father, please inspire us. Help us to realise that it ought to be in our very nature. It should just be natural to us to love others. Please help us, change us and transform us where we haven't been loving, where we haven't made it our priority to love others. And particularly, Lord, would we love others by inviting them to church or giving away Christian literature? Father, would we love others by encouraging others in Christ in what we're doing here on Sundays and during the week. But we don't want to be a, a small lifeboat in Putney. We want to grow. Pray, Lord, that we'd be on board and committed as we reach over to reach out to others because we love them. And would you, by your Spirit, now apply this passage in people's hearts. You know where people are at, whether they really need a a strong rebuke or a mild one or no rebuke at all maybe. Father, we leave that to you and the conscience of people here. But please, Lord, change us and transform us as a church and as individuals to love others more. In Jesus' name, Amen.